Mother has said, Savitri is a mantra for the transformation of the world. She also said that Savitri is the supreme revelation of Sri Aurobindo's vision. At one point, she even says, all else that he has written is just nothing compared to Savitri. Wow. So those of you who are so sincerely devoted to Savitri, we take it upon ourselves to go very slowly, line by line, so that we can imbibe that force. We cannot so easily understand it with the mind because it's something that's written so far above the mind. What we can do is take it into our consciousness, let it rest there and begin to enlighten us through the opening of our psychic being. Namaste, or we'll begin. On page 12, we have seen that Savitri now has to make a choice. That hour had fallen now on Savitri. And we see that she has to make some very major decisions because she has to lift this yoke, this fixed interminable line. She has to release these changing names and these numberless lives and these new oblivious personalities. These are all things that we are. We are these things. We've been born one lakh times or more. We're born, uh, when we die, we, we take birth in two years. And so we have changing names. We have numberless lives. And we even have oblivious personalities because we don't remember our past births. So now we have to go to page 13 and see what Savitri has to do. She's ha having this colloquy of the original gods. Her being has to confront its formless cause against the universe. It has to weigh its single self. Oh, so many things she has to do because she has to alter nature's harsh economy. What is that harsh economy? Well, I believe I told you last time that Nature doesn't care how long she takes to make the Superman. She's very happy doing what she's doing, creating something each, each moment, destroying something at the same moment. Creating and destroying, that's her game, that's her play, and she loves it. But when Mother met her and asked her, at first Nature refused to help Mother. And then when mother said, you'll become much more beautiful and much more powerful, nature finally agreed. So it is nature now who is helping the divine mother in this work. Humanity, mother says very little about. In Oroville, it, it, we don't really mean anything. The work is going on even without us, which is a great relief to me. <laughs> because there are so many schisms in Oroville. So let us see now what Savitri has to do. Acquittance she must win from her past bond. Whoa. Acquittance. Acquittance is a release from debt or a release from obligation. So she has a debt or an obligation from her past. And it's a bond, past tense of bind, it's bound her. Hmm? She has to free from that. 
she has to do much more, of course. An old account of suffering exhaust. Strike out from time the soul's long compound debt. Interesting word. I know about compound debt. I bought a house once when the interest rate was 17%, and all we paid for 10 years was interest. The compound debt just kept increasing, increasing. So, Savitri has to strike, strike out from time the soul's long compound debt. And, what, and compound debt is a debt that has increased with the addition of interest compounded through the years. This is what Savitri is facing. She, this is not the first time the Divine Mother has been on earth. The Divine Mother has been on earth since the creation in many, many forms, in many, many ways. Perhaps not always as the Divine Mother. Perhaps she was Virgin Mary. Perhaps she, we know she was in Egypt. Nefertiti, I believe, she was. She was in Russia. I think she was uh, the great empress in Russia. But Mother gives us little hints once in a while as to what she was. So, <clears throat> Savitri has to strike out from time the soul's long compound debt. And the heavy servitudes of the karmic gods. Whoa, incredible line. Servitudes. Conditions of a slave. Bondage. One has no ability to act as one chooses because the karmic gods have us as servants. Now, Sri Aurobindo says, if we believe that the soul is repeatedly reborn in the body, we must believe also that there is some link between the lives that preceded and the lives that follow, and that the past of the soul has an effect on its future, and that the spiritual and that is the spiritual essence of the law of karma. That's from his essays on philosophy and yoga. Now, in the same book, he says, the spiritual law of karma is that the nature of each being can only be the result of his past energies. So, what happens when we die? Many of you know this. Things fall away from us. The first things that fall away are the bodily things. The next things that fall away, sometimes a little bit more challengingly, are the vital. And then the mind. And the psychic being takes with it only those things that help raise the consciousness of the body in that incarnation. So when we prepare to take birth, the next, our next birth, we choose our parents. I talked to you about this last week. Because we have a work to do and the, and the choice of the parents is going to dictate what work we have to do or help us or challenge us, whatever. So, what else does Savitri have to do? She has to... This slow revenge of unforgiving law. Now, law is only active on the lowest planes of consciousness, body, life, and mind. When we rise into the next plane of consciousness, from the higher mind, illumined, intuitive, overmind, the law changes tremendously. It's not the law we have, 
There's no morality any longer. There's no sin any longer. We're in a different state of existence. So she has to... We see the slow revenge of unforgiving law is tied into karma. Very clearly. What else does she have to do? And the deep need of universal pain and hard sacrifice and tragic consequence. At this level of our existence, with joy, pain will always come. With truth, falsehood. We live in dualities at this level of existence. Those dualities tend to disappear in the higher ranges of consciousness. Did you have a question? Go ahead. Was it like the souls are there somewhere and then constantly looking for who is my, who is going to be my parents, mm -hmm. the choice, all those things, you know, they constantly look for so in my during my rest, I was looking for parents and I found my parents, you know, somewhere in that place. Some country, some nation, and yes. So I found my mother and father. Is that really the way? Yes, that's really the way it works. Because your he says here, the past energies have created our karma. And our karma is not the bad thing that people often talk about it. It just means that we have things to accomplish in each birth. And they're important things. Um, Vivekananda never got over anger. And he was a great vibhuti. Great vibhuti. So, uh, Raman Maharshi never had any idea about the supermental. Sri Aurobindo and mother brought it down. His was a different path, as Ramakrishna's was a different path. See? And many people are very satisfied with those paths. Mukti, liberation. Ananda of the divine. Conscious uniting with the divine consciousness why go further leave this world of illusion behind buddha said forget it merge into the divine you'll be happy forever sri arbindo says no no you must come back down to earth make earth divine that's why we're here now that's why savitri has come here so she has to face all these things, the deep need of universal pain, the hard sacrifice. Much of, much of our lives have been hard sacrifice. Even when you're young, you have hard sacrifice. I'm a little older and I know it. Now, out of a timeless barrier, she must break, penetrate with her thinking depths the voids monstrous hush, look into the lonely eyes of immortal death. And there's so much on death. And with her nude spirit, measure the infinite's night. She has come to challenge death, to eliminate death as a possibility from the world. Now, that won't be for everyone. It will be only for those who have risen to greater heights. There will still be death amongst the masses because the consciousness has to increase. And we have to realize that there are many nations where people may just have been born from an animal an evolution rising from an animal birth. And so mind is not very developed. Heart is not very developed. 
it's more instinctive. Now, this doesn't mean the whole group of, of a nation because there are always great souls everywhere. It can be in the poorest nation, it doesn't matter. Okay, so this is what Savitri has to do. Now we're going to go to that moment. The great and dolorous moment now was close. Ah, a dolorous moment. Something that causes pain or sorrow. Something that is mournful. Full of grievous pain. The great and dolorous moment now was close. A mailed battalion marching to its doom, the last long days went by with heavy tramp, long but too soon to pass, too near the end. Okay, quite a bit to talk about. What is a mailed battalion? Hmm. Mail is flexible armor that the knights would wear. And a battalion, of course, is an army unit of uh, headquarters, a couple of companies, batteries, and organized troops marching to its doom. What is this male battalion marching to its doom? He tells us in the next line, it's the long days. The long days are like a mailed battalion marching to its doom. And they go by with heavy tramp. An army always tramps. They have songs, tramp, 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 etc. So now we are understanding a little bit more about what Savitri is going through. The great and dolorous moment now is close. A mailed battalion marching to its doom. The last long days went by with heavy tramp. Long, but too soon to pass. Too near the end. Because now we're going to learn that, this is again the flashback, that Savitri already knows that Satchiman is going to die in one year. She knows it already. And so we hear, alone amid the many faces loved. Everyone loved her. I mean, she's the child of God, Savitri. Aware among unknowing happy hearts. All the family was so happy with her. I mean, she lived in a palace. She lived in a palace with these fountains and these gardens and birds and so many ornate, beautiful things of gold and silver. And she had a wonderful life. But no one could claim her in marriage. Many came. Some wanted her for themselves, some were jealous of her and demanded that she marry them. A father finally says, go out and find your answering soul. And she has to go through many, many countries, long countries, she goes. And finally she arrives in this little hermitage, just in a deep, deep forest. So now we're going to see what is happening. Alone among the many faces loved, aware among unknowing happy hearts, her armored spirit kept watch upon the hours, listening for a foreseen tremendous step in the closed beauty of the human wilds. Well, we just had the mailed battalion. We just had tramping. We had we had mailed, we had battalion, we had tramping. And now we have 
armored spirit. See how Sri Aurobindo brings everything together. Her spirit has to be armored. It has to face death. It has to conquer death. So, her armored spirit kept watch upon the hours. Because every hour is precious now. Such a one's going to die soon. Every hour is precious. Her armored spirit kept watch upon the hours, listening for a foreseen tremendous step. Foreseen foreknowledge, prescience. in the closed beauty of the inhuman wilds. So she is now in Shalwa Woods with Satyavan. But as this is a flashback, Sri Aurobindo is just telling us what's going to happen. Now we have the word a combatant in silent, dreadful list. Lists are places of combat. We'd have the lists of these soldiers fighting each other. Uh, dread, of course, is profound fear. And we see the world unknowing. For the world she stood. No helper had she, save the strength within. Save here means accept except the strength within. There was no witness of terrestrial eyes. No one is around them. She asks Satyavan's mother if she may go into the woods with him that day. She knows he's going to leave his body then. And so nobody knows anything at this time, except that Narad told Ashwapati and his wife, and Savitri, when he met them, that Satyavan would go. And we're going to get into those wonderful books where Narada and the Queen <clears throat> discourse about everything, about nihilism, about ex existentialism, about God and non-God, etc. Now, but we go back to Savitri now. There was no witness of terrestrial eyes, earthly eyes, nobody on earth. So, the gods above and nature, soul below. Now look at those two, that, those two words. Gods, capital G, nature, capital N. And what did Nolini tell me? He said, when Sri Aurobindo capitalizes a word, a word, it means the essence of that word. Very important. Other people say, no, Sri Aurobindo just did it randomly now and then. Sri Aurobindo did nothing randomly in Savitri. Even every word, T-H-E-A-N-D, was consciously used. And what does he tell us? He says, because he rewrote Book 1, Canto 1, how many times? Fifty. Fifty times he rewrote it. Why did he rewrite it? He tells that to Amal. He said, each time I reached a higher plane of existence, I wrote from that plane. And then when I was at the next plane, I would see if anything was not up to the mark in the previous writing, and I would change it. And I have seen 16 different uh, changes from the documents in the archives where Sri Aurobindo would change notes, change lines. So all of this is absolutely true and it's there in the ashram archives. Now, <clears throat> we can talk about the gods, we can talk about nature, but I want to keep it very simple because I could go on for one hour just on that one line. And then maybe it gets too much. But in Essays Divine and Human, he says, For nature is nothing but the will of God in action. 
The will of God in action is nature. And then he says, nature is God's power of various self-becoming from essays on the Gita. So we see that. Now, the gods above and nature soul below were the spectators of that mighty strife. So nature's watching this confrontation with death and the gods up above are watching it. They all want to know what's going to happen. And so do we. Around her, and now this is so beautiful because Sri Aurobindo is giving us a little bit of intense beauty here about Savitri's <clears throat> environment. Around her were the austere sky-pointing hills. Austere means forbidding, stark. And Satyavan's living in a place where these huge mountains are there and forests all around. There are only some small clearings, which is where she met him. We'll get into that much later, but around her were the austere sky-pointing hills and the green, murmurous, broad, deep-thoughted woods muttered incessantly their muffled spell. And so we see that everything is living. Not every stone has a consciousness. Every stone has a vibration. Okay, it doesn't have a mind, it doesn't have a vital nature. It's uh, what we would call tamasic or inert, but there is movement in it. And I believe, do you remember what I told you about Khalil Gibran? Anyone? Khalil Gibran said, the only difference between me and a stone is the speed of our heartbeats. What a great line. Okay. Around her were the austere, sky-pointing hills and the green, murmurous, broad, deep-thoughted woods muttered incessantly their muffled spell, incessantly, continuing without interruption. A dense, magnificent, colored, self-wrapped life of course, it's self-wrapped. Nothing else is coming in that area. They've only got a little hut where they live and these mountains, and that's where Satyavan grew up and made his acquaintance with nature. So, a dense, magnificent, colored, self-wrapped life draped in the leaves of vivid emerald monotone. Yeah, the leaves are very green. Uh, they're draped in this emerald green monotone and set with checkered sunbeams and blithe flowers. Immured her destiny's secluded scene. So we have a few words here, checkered means something that's marked by numerous and uh, different shifts. In checkers or chess, we have movements that go like this. So this magnificent colored self-wrapped life is set with checkered sunbeams. They come through a leaf here, they come through a tree here, they come through something here, and blithe flowers. Blithe is joyous or merry, happy flowers, cheerful flowers. Immured her destiny's secluded scene. To immure something is to shut it in, to seclude it, to confine it. Now he takes us in another place. There had she grown to the stature of her spirit. The genius of titanic silences steeping her soul in its wide loneliness 
I'll have to go to the next page. What he's telling us here is that Savitri had grown to the stature of her spirit, being with Satyavan, her answering soul. And this genius of titanic silences, titanic here is not capitalized. Titan is often capitalized in Savitri, and Sri Aurobindo has a lot to tell us about it. Nietzsche, his Titan, was the one that we don't want. The one who wants to grab the world in his fists and rise to greater heights. But here, Titan simply means something of great force or power. So, the genius of tit titanic silences. Now, uh, genius, interesting word. Mother speaks to us about the genius of the species. Something that represents a species. Could be cocoa, could be sunflower could be wheat, and that grain will represent the genius of the species. Now, later on, when Savitri first meets Sachivan, she comes with this, these white horses drawing her carriage, beautiful carriage. She gets down, and she sees the beauty of this little place, no trees there just a great, great pasture. She sees birds and butterflies and bees and colored flowers and so many fragrances. And she almost misses Satyavan. But the God saves her in time. He seemed a genius of the species there. So, we're going to go next, and I have to go there to page 14, where the genius of titanic silences had shown to her herself's bare reality and mated her with her environment. Now, we have an interesting thing here because most writers even poets, do not put two words together that are the same. So here we have her, her, had shown to her herself's bare reality. And then he does it again in the synthesis of yoga. All that is, is he. All that is, is he. Yeah. And he is the more than all that is. Well, I won't quote that to you now. But uh, so this genius of titanic silences had shown to her herself's bare reality and mated her with her environment. Its solitude greatened her human hours with a background of the eternal and unique. And then he says, a force of spare direct necessity reduced the heavy framework of man's days and his overburdening mass of outward needs to a first thin strip of simple animal wants. And the mighty wideness of the primitive earth and the brooding multitude of patient trees, and the musing sapphire leisure of the sky, <coughs> and the solemn weight of the slowly passing months had left in her deep room for thought and God. So now we have to go back and see what's happening. We have a force of spare direct necessity. Now, Sri Aurobindo tells us in the next few lines that man's days 
have an overburdening mass of outward needs. We always have, ne I need, oh, I need to get this from the pharmacy. I need to get this from Portus. I need to, I need to do this. I need to do this tomorrow. We're full of outward needs. It's incredible. He, he, he's telling us all about ourselves. A force of spare direct necessity reduced the heavy framework of man's days. The framework is the structure of man's days. And his overburdening, something that weighs us down too much, overloads us. His overburdening mass of outward needs not inward needs, outward needs, to a first thin strip of simple animal wants. We have to eat, we have to sleep, we have to love each other, and that's about it. These are the simple animal wants that have been reduced with her living in this forest with Satchivan. And so then he writes so beautifully and the mighty wild wideness and the mighty wideness some people read wildness it's not wildness it's wideness and the mighty wideness of the primitive earth sorry it's wildness and the mighty wildness of the primitive earth because the primitive earth is totally wild there. Go a hundred meters in one direction and you're in the densest forest where you could be lost. So this mighty wildness of the primitive earth, primitive, of course, simple, uns unsophisticated, crude, unrefined earth, and the brooding multitude of patient trees. We know what brooding it is. Brooding, of course, a chicken will brood her young. But brooding here means more meditating or dwelling deeply on something. So we have the brooding multitude of patient trees because they are conscious also. Don't forget their whole life is an aspiration for light. If ours could be that, our entire life an aspiration for light, and the brooding multitude of patient trees, and the musing sapphire leisure of the sky, and the solemn weight of the slowly passing months. These passing months have a solemn weight because she's counting the days till he's going to die. had left in her deep room for thought and God. Any questions? I'll go on a little bit more and then we'll close for today. There was her drama's radiant prologue, Live. Set in the cloistral yearning of the woods. You know, a cloister is a secluded, quiet place, very often for nuns of the Catholic Church. And we had a cloister in New York City, away up in New York City, and I would go to it often. There is a long, long path where you walk along and meditate. There are flowers and plants on either side. There's absolute quietness all around. You don't feel New York at all. It's a cloister. And we need those quiet places. A spot for the Eternal's tread on earth. That's where the Eternal is going to tread on earth. Because she's going to bring him down after she vanquishes death. A spot for the eternal's tread on earth, set in the cloistral yearning of the woods, and watched, <clears throat> interesting, and watched by the aspiration of the peaks. 
Sri Aurobindo is telling us the peaks are conscious. They watch us. <clears throat> I just wrote something today, a little aside, but um, my wife and I were in Darjeeling uh, on this long parapet overlooking <clears throat> the plains of India from a great height. And this gentleman comes up to me and he says, Good, good morning. My name is Tenzing Norgay. <laughs> and we talked for half an hour. It was the most wonderful conversation. Tenzing Norgay took Hillary to the top of Everest. And it is said that he actually arrived there first. But Hillary took all the credit. But it was a wonderful meeting. Okay, uh, just an aside. All right. <clears throat> the spot for the Eternal's tread on earth, set in the cloistral yearning of the woods and watched by the aspiration of the peaks, appeared through an aureate opening in time, a golden opening in time. <sighs> golden, of course. Aureate is golden. Okay. where stillness, listening, felt the unspoken word, and the hours forgot to pass towards grief and change. Here, with the suddenness divine advents have, repeating the marvel of the first descent, changing to rapture the dull earthly round, Love came to her, hiding the shadow death. We'll go through death somewhat next week, but I'd like to end with some quotes on what love really is tonight from Sri Aurobindo. In his letters on yoga, Love is an intense self-expression of the soul of Ananda. In the Life Divine, he says, Love is in its nature the desire to give oneself to others and to receive others in exchange. In the Letters on Yoga, again, he says, Love at its origin, at its origin, is a self-existent force, an absolute, a transcendent, which does not depend upon the objects. It depends only on itself or only on the divine, for it is a self-existent power of the divine. And in the synthesis of yoga, he says, love is the crown of all being and its way of fulfillment, that by which it rises to all intensity and all fullness and the ecstasy of utter self-finding. Then Mother says, love is in its essence the joy of identity. It finds its ultimate expression in the bliss of union. In a book on education, Mother says, Consciousness is indeed the creatrix of the universe, but love is its savior. Savior. 